In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. This passage of Scripture raises several questions that every human being should consider. First, in the beginning. In the beginning of what? Second, in the beginning was the Word. Who or what is this Word? Third, without him nothing was made that was made. That's a double negative. What should we make of that? And finally, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. Further, it is the light that shines in the darkness. What's that all about? Let's tackle these questions one at a time. It helps if first we understand who wrote those words, because knowing that gives us a significant clue about whom he is writing. A disciple of Jesus named John wrote these words. But how do we know that? Well, interestingly, though John is named in the other three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, never once does the man who wrote this Gospel mention himself by name. Instead, he refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. The Gospel writer is just too modest to use his own name. Matthew tells us John was the brother of James. Mark tells us that they were sons of a man called Zebedee. And Luke tells us that John and his brother James were business partners with Peter. They were fishermen. These three men made up an inner circle of the closest companions of Jesus Christ. Luke also tells us that Jesus was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. Unfortunately, nowhere in the Bible will you find the ages of his apostles. But there are several clues that hint at their ages. First, in Jewish culture, the disciples of a rabbi were seldom older than their teacher. Peter may have been the exception. He was probably the oldest of the twelve apostles. We derive this partly because of the leadership role Peter assumed within the group. Also, Peter was already married when he became Jesus' disciple. Recall that Jesus was once called upon to heal Peter's mother-in-law, who had been sick with fever. And these four fishermen were the first disciples called by Jesus. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and his brother John, in the boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Note that Peter and Andrew were fishing on their own boat that day, but James and John were with their father. That implies that those two were younger men. Assuming that their father was in his forties or fifties, after all, he was still working as a fisherman, James and John were likely in their late teens or in their early twenties. And since James is always mentioned first, he was surely the older son. And so John may have been only 17 or 18 years old when he became a disciple of Jesus. John also lived the longest, surviving long after the other disciples had all been put to death. John always expressed his personal relationship with Jesus by calling himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. Recall this incident from after Jesus had been crucified. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own household. John was selected to care for Jesus' mother because he was the youngest. Jesus knew that he would outlive the others, for John was the only disciple who was not martyred. In his later years, however, he was imprisoned on the Isle of Patmos. There, having already penned his gospel and the epistles we call 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, he also wrote the book of Revelation. Some historians believe that John died there on Patmos. Others say that he was freed shortly before his death. Since the Bible doesn't tell us, no one is 100% certain where and when John died. 
but they all agree that John died a wizened old man. And so we begin today a 26-week study of John's Gospel, often referred to as the Gospel of Love. Some of the greatest truths about God's loving nature are found in the Gospel of John, including this one. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's the most often quoted verse in the Bible, John 3:16. It is said to be the gospel in a single verse, for it reveals all we need to know about God's sacrificial love for us. So now that we understand who wrote these words, let's get back to those four questions. First, in the beginning. In the beginning of what? Well, since God is eternal and has no beginning and no end, when John writes in the beginning, he's not referencing the beginning of God. That's impossible. So he must be referring to the beginning of us, we humans. Us and the universe we live in, which is God's creation. Don't be persuaded by those learned men of today who claim the wonders of the universe resulted from some sort of cosmic accident. Naturalistic scientists believe that a natural process formed the universe over 13 billion years ago. They believe that such a long period allowed order to come from disorder. Really? If you deconstruct all the parts of your grandfather's old wind-up pocket watch and set it afloat in a weightless vacuum, guess what? No matter how many billions of years you wait, there is no possibility of those watch parts reassembling themselves and winding the spring to begin its ticking again. Certainly not if you expect it to tell the correct time. And even if it did manage to do all that, you still have the question, who created all those watch parts in the first place? Listen, order never arises from disorder. Harmony is not the result of chaos. The order and harmony we observe in the universe is obviously there by design. Naturalistic scientists cannot tell you who provided the harmony we observe in the universe. And the universe isn't 13 billion years old. It's much younger than that. The Bible genealogies and historical timeline indicates that God supernaturally created the universe about 6,000 years ago. All of the intricate workings of the universe we may observe reflect God's incredible creativity. And that includes the Earth and the Moon, of course, but also all those uncounted galaxies out there in the uncharted universe that we call stars. Each of those galaxies has millions of suns much like ours and countless planets orbiting around them. Why did God create all those gazillions of galaxies? Just so we would have pinpricks of light in the night sky? Perhaps, but that doesn't align with the creative nature of our God. Of course, nowhere in the Bible does it hint that God created human-like life forms on other planets in other galaxies. But I must point out to you, nowhere does the Bible declare that he didn't either. Frankly, I wouldn't be surprised one bit if, when we all get to heaven, we find ourselves singing and shouting the victory with other beings from other planets circling other suns in other far distant galaxies that are similar to our own. But that's just speculation on my part. And that brings us to the second question. In the beginning was the word. Who or what is this word? Well, John answers that question himself. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. That clearly is a man, and he is the man that John and the others chose to follow as disciples. He was a rabbi named Jesus. This rabbi was born of a mother, as all humans are. He had a heart, a mind, a spirit, just as we do. But at the same time, this man was different. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called synoptic gospels. They include many of the same stories, often in the same synoptic sequence, and in similar or sometimes identical wording. John's gospel is different. It provides a unique view of this man, Jesus. John declared him to be the Word made flesh who dwelt among us. 
Third question, what about the double negative John deployed in declaring that without him nothing was made that was made? What should we make of that? Well, let's start by converting the double negative into a positive statement. Without him nothing was made that was made may also be said this way. With him everything was made that has been made. In other words, with this word made flesh, everything was made that has been made everything. And that includes, well, everything. Understanding that Jesus was with God and was God and was there at the beginning, and that without him nothing was created that has been created, expands our understanding of the man quite a little bit. Clearly, he was more than a mere man. John is telling us that Jesus was and is and has always been God, the creator of the universe. And God so loved planet Earth and the people he created here, that he became a male human himself, a son born miraculously to a virgin, and for one purpose, to save us. Jesus, who knew no sin, became the sacrificial lamb slain for the forgiveness of our sins. And now the final question. What is this that John calls the light of men, a light that shines in the darkness? Well, the light of men is a traditional reference to awareness and human knowledge. That's why in a cartoon, when a character has a bright idea, the cartoonist always draws him with a light bulb flashing over his head. Jesus was the light of men. He possessed full awareness of who he was. He also possessed the knowledge of humanity's great need for a savior. He was the light of men that shined in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. That darkness is humankind. It is all those who do not know Jesus, who do not believe in him. It is they who have not been born again. And when it comes to Christ Jesus, sadly, those who are in darkness are all around us. At this time of year, as we celebrate the birth of the light of man, the lost are celebrating something else entirely. They invented the myth of Santa Claus and preferred to use him as a symbol of this most important of all holidays. As for us, we celebrate the birth of a Savior, Christ Jesus the Lord. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. From the very beginning, humans were told of a king and of his coming. The Lord his God is with him, and the shout of a king is among them. Those words were spoken by a prophet of God named Balaam. Scripture declares that God met with Balaam and warned him, only speak the words I tell you to speak. That established a standard for all future prophets. They are to speak only the word God tells them to speak. For that reason, the Bible itself is often referred to as the word of God. It was Balaam who uttered this prophecy. A star shall come out of Jacob, a scepter shall rise out of Israel. That brings to mind the star that led the Magi to Bethlehem. Let's take a moment to talk about that star of Bethlehem. Here's what the Bible tells us. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. First of all, who was in the east? It's right there in verse 1. Behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. As far back as 1835, when the hymn Star in the East first appeared in our hymn books, people got the idea that it was the star that was in the east. Everyone from Harry Belafonte to Judy Garland have sung about the star in the east. But that's not what the scripture says. The star wasn't in the east. The Magi were in the east. For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. While they were in the east, they saw the star. True east of Israel takes you to modern day Iraq. Personally, I believe these wise men came from Baghdad. For Baghdad possessed a culture then that was steeped in the study of the night sky. They traveled first to Jerusalem. But the star the Magi saw couldn't have been in the eastern skies, other than the fact that the sun, moon, and everything else rises in the east and sets in the west. The star of Bethlehem must have been a southern star. Well, how do I know that? 
Well, when King Herod learned of a newborn king from the visiting Magi, he called together the chief priests and teachers of the law and asked them where the Messiah was to be born. They had no trouble coming up with an answer for him. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. The chief priests and the teachers of the law were quoting the prophet Micah. Micah's prophecy made it clear that the newborn king would be found in Bethlehem. But where is Bethlehem located in relationship to Jerusalem? It's due south, about six miles. Then Herod called the Magi together secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, "'Go and search carefully for the child.' As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I, too, may go and worship him. The wise men were smarter than that. They were warned by God in a dream not to return to Jerusalem. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. The wise men were heading south, traveling from Jerusalem toward Bethlehem. Yes, the star of Bethlehem rose in the east, but it lay ahead of them as they were traveling south. So it must have been somewhere in the southern skies. It rose in a giant arc above them, apparently laying low in the night sky. So low, it appeared to hover over the manger where the newborn baby Jesus lay. Of course, it could be that God created a special phenomena that looked a lot like a star to those wise men. But the brightest star in the southern sky we see at night is called Sirius. Sirius is easy to spot. If you follow the belt of the constellation Orion downward, it points to the brightest star in the night sky, Sirius. So if it is a star we're familiar with, Sirius is the most likely contender. But seeing Sirius would not have startled the wise men. It has always been there, unless there was something unusual going on with Sirius at the time. Sirius is a binary star. That means that it is really two stars that circle one another. Here is a Hubble Space Telescope image of Sirius. Its binary partner, a white dwarf, is that dot on the lower left. One is brighter than the other, and the dimmer one may be dying. It is possible that at the birth of Christ, the dimmer dying star of the binary star Sirius flared up in such a way that the Magi in the east took notice of it. These men came from the east, and they followed that star. And a thousand years earlier, King Solomon foretold of those visitors bearing gifts. Those who dwell in the wilderness will bow before him, and his enemies will lick the dust. The kings of Tarshish and the isles will bring presents. The kings of Sheba and Seba will offer gifts. Tarsha, Sheba, and Seba were all grandsons of Noah. Since all humans are descendants of Noah, the psalmist is declaring that all the world will one day bow before the king of kings. Unbelievers scoff at the gospel account of the star of Bethlehem, followed by wise men from afar who came heralding the birth of a newborn king. Unbelievers often cite the fact that many so-called gods and ancient mythical heroes were said to have been born under a bright star or some other sort of celestial sign. Well, we all know that imitation is the greatest form of flattery. These ancient myths are merely Satan's attempt to imitate the truth that we read in Scripture. His goal is to undercut the truth of the Bible. Instead, he supports it. You see, nothing written by man either predates nor preempts God's word. Hundreds of years prior to the origin of these ancient myths, God's prophets foretold the birth of Messiah. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel, of course, means God with us. Thanks also to Isaiah, ancient Jews knew that the Messiah would be a descendant of Jesse, the great-grandson of King David. 
There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Another incredibly specific prophecy regarding Jesus' birth involved a horrific massacre in Bethlehem. Thus says the Lord, a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted for her children because they are no more. Rachel is here representing all the women in Judea at the time of Christ's birth. Fearful of losing his position as king, Herod had ordered the death of all boys under two years of age. God's prophet Hosea revealed that the Messiah would live for a time in Egypt. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. Micah, also a prophet of God, some 700 years before the event took place, foretold the precise name of the very little town where the Messiah would be born. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from of old. Unbelievers call the birth of Jesus a myth. Of course, those who do not believe the word of God consider everything in the Bible to be a myth. But even those without faith have to admit that these and other prophetic writings found in ancient texts are amazingly accurate in the depiction of the birth of Christ. It's all just a matter of who you're going to believe. Will you believe those who admit they are unbelievers? Or the Bible, whose prophets foretold with 100% accuracy the birth of a newborn king? As for me, I stand upon the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. I'm Rich Musler, pastor of a very small church in Louisville, Texas. Enjoy this Christmas season, but take a moment to ponder these prophecies written centuries ago that foretell the birth of Jesus, and read again the story of Christ's birth as told in Luke chapter 2. We'll talk more about it next week when, Lord willing, I'll see you then.